Hello, everybody. I am your host, Donnie. We at Standing for Truth Ministries are dedicated to defending the truth of biblical creation. I do want to thank you all for being here for this important presentation. I also want to mention that we do also host debates, interviews, lectures, and more. And so if you enjoy this content, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and share around this content as the truth is so incredibly important. It is a privilege to have Dr. Jerry Bergman here for another important presentation. Today's presentation is based on this book right here, written by Dr. Jerry Bergman, C.S. Lewis, Anti-Darwinist. It is commonly believed that C.S. Lewis was a theistic evolutionist a conclusion based on a few statements that he made in The Problem of Pain and Mere Christianity. A careful study of his writings reveals not only that for most of his life, he was not a theistic evolutionist, but strongly opposed Darwinism, especially towards the end of his life. Now, before Dr. Bergman gives his presentation, I want to give my guest a brief introduction. Dr. Jerry Bergman has taught biology, genetics, chemistry, biochemistry, anthropology, geology, and microbiology for over 40 years at several colleges and universities, including Bowling Green State University, Medical College of Ohio, where he was a research associate in experimental pathology, and the University of Toledo. He is a graduate of the Medical College of Ohio, Wayne State University in Detroit, and University of Toledo, and Bowling Green State University. He has over 1,300 publications in 12 languages and 40 books and monographs. His books and textbooks that include chapters that he authored are in over 1,500 college libraries, and 27 countries. So far, over 80,000 copies of the 40 books and monographs that he has authored or co-authored are in print. I do want to let the audience know that the relevant links to uh, Dr. Jerry Bergman's website, as well as the Amazon page where you can find these important books, are listed in the description box. Uh, Dr. Jerry Bergman, thank you so much for once again giving us your time for this important show. Oh, actually, Jerry, I think on your end, um, you have to click unmute. Yeah, you're good. You're good. I'm good now. Okay. Okay. Well, I appreciate you being here, uh, Dr. Bergman. And I think we're just going to get right into the show. I've got your, your screen up here now. And if, if you're ready, we can get right in, into the presentation. I'm ready. Okay. C.S. Lewis one of the most favorite authors of Christians worldwide. And uh, he is well known for fiction as well as his nonfiction. He was a professor of philosophy at one time as well as literature. And it's commonly believed by many people that he was a theistic evolutionist. And I assume this was correct myself until I started doing some reading on him. And I found out he was not only not a theistic evolutionist, but was very effective in countering the claims of evolution. And I'll give you a poem, which is one way of communicating. And one of Lewis's favorite ways is by poetry. And if you think beyond this, it really is quite, quite profound what he had to say. He said, lead us evolution, lead us. Up the future's endless stare. Chop us, change us, prod us, weed us. For stagnation is despair, groping, guessing, yet progressing. Lead us, nobody knows to where. <laughs> and think about that. Indeed, that is a very good description of what Darwinian evolution teaches. And uh, he was effective, I think, in many ways because he forces one to think about his writing. And in this case, it's quite clear. Uh, has humans stopped evolving? Well, many leading Darwinists say, yes, we have. Some claim we'll continue to evolve, but of course, what, in, what into? And that's really what Lewis was asking when he wrote this poem, which is much longer, but I'm trying to just give you a short version of what he had to say. 
So in 10,000 years from now, what could we evolve into? Think about that. Uh, it's hard to even guess. People have theorized maybe we'll lose our legs because we don't need them anymore because we have so many gadgets that will get us around without legs. But I don't think so. Lewis has, and I quote, succeeded as few others in causing Christianity to be discussed seriously and publicly. And they did a survey of 101 church leaders, and guess what they found? His book, Mere Christianity, was the top 10 most influential books they've ever read. And there's actually quite a long list of people who were converted to Christianity by reading the works of C.S. Lewis. And as of this writing, he is still the best-selling Christian author of all time. And he gave 29 British Broadcast Channel le lectures uh, during World War II, and this reached an enormous audience, about 600,000 people. And these lectures were eventually turned into his books. And he penned about nine books, about 30 essays that explored science and its impact on our modern culture. Now, he wasn't a scientist. He wasn't a biologist. And he recognized that. And he said, you know, I could spend the next 20 years becoming a biologist and deal with that issue and, and evolution. But on the other hand, I think the most important way of dealing with that is philosophically. What does evolution mean? What, what are the implications of evolution for humans? And he saw that as his niche, and that's good. I'm glad he didn't go back and get a degree in biology so he could deal with the biological questions. There's plenty of other people that can deal with those questions, and so he dealt with an area which was not dealt with that much. And uh, he produced 49 major titles, so he was a very prolific author. Well, he was single for most of his life, and, you know, he taught at uh, Oxford as well as Cambridge, and he had time to do a lot of writing, and that was his life, reading and writing. His house was filled full of books, and of course, he spent a good deal of his time reading and writing. And uh, in 67, some of his published books were published after he had died, and so that's quite good because we have few, a few things that were very important which did not come out until after he passed, until he went on to his greater reward. And here's a few of his books from uh, my library, and there are many others, but uh, this just gives you a sampling of his many, many books. He taught at the university level for about 40 years, from 1925 until his premature death at age 64. And that's really pretty young. And unfortunately, he had some habits, which many professors had at that time, which he was never able to deal with. He didn't take care of his health that much, well, he spent his time reading, writing, and lecturing. And so he probably neglected his health, and therefore he died prematurely. And he is, C.S. Lewis is believed in argument, in disputation, and in the dialect of reason. He stressed that. He believed in argument and disputation. That's an important way of interacting with others. Because he believed that the main business of life was a bold hunt for truth. And he really spent his life in a bold hunt for truth. And he was able to find many things out, confirm and show us many things. And so we can spend less time and be able to achieve what he did in less time. One of his concerns was quite clear. He feared that science would lead to rejection of absolute standards and traditional objective values. And indeed, now this was written, what, 50, 60 years ago? And indeed, he was very correct in this statement. And a good example, which is contemporary now, is the abortion issue. There are some people who feel that it's a good thing for a woman to have an abortion. It interferes with her career. But what about the child? People don't tend to talk, or at least many people, don't tend to talk much about the child. But before this time, 50, 60 years ago, the absolute standards was thou shalt not kill, period. Doesn't matter whether the life is a month old, six month old, six months old, 10 years, 50 years, it doesn't matter. Life is sacred. And that value for many people at least has been lost. And C.S. Lewis, a quote 
from him. And you can see in the background, there is a Nazi SS officer killing a Jewish man. And he said, Lewis said, if no set of moral issues were truer or better than any other, there would be no sense in preferring civilized morality to savage morality or Christian morality to Nazi morality. And indeed, of course, in the Nazis, that was their morals. Uh, people say the Nazis were immoral. They were not immoral. They simply had a different moral standard, a very different moral standard. And to them, it was morally right to eliminate inferior human beings and people who he felt had no right to live. And he was one of the most important Christian apologists of the last century. And he was at Cambridge, which is one of the most important universities in the world. And he was there since 1954 until he passed on. And he concluded that the modern theory of evolutionary naturalism, often we call Darwinism in honor, of course, of Charles Darwin, was the most important modern popularizers of evolution, Darwin was, and Darwinism was one of the most destructive ideas, these were his words, one of the most destructive ideas ever foisted on civilization. And I've spent much of my career documenting that. I have about a dozen books which show in detail, indeed, that this idea of evolution was one of the most, if not the most destructive ideas ever foisted upon civilization. And a good example of this was a conversation he had when at a faculty meeting, the faculty were there discussing things and someone asked who he'd like to meet, anyone living or dead. And this was last by Oxford professor, Helen Gardner. And uh, Lewis said, Adam, and Helen Gardner was shocked. She was surprised. And she said, if there really was someone we can name as the first man, he would be a Neanderthal, a like figure, whose conversation she could not conceive of finding interesting. And then, of course, there was silence at the dinner table. And then Lewis said gruffly, very clearly, I see we have a Darwinian in our midst. And by the way, they never met for social activities. Again, I'm not sure that was on the part of Lewis, but that was on the part of, from what I understand, Helen, Professor Helen Gardner. And there you can see he is in his study. A messy desk, bachelor. Okay, why is this important? Well, 93% of the members of the America's most elite scientific body, the National Academy of Sciences, were agnostics or atheists. Only 7% believe in a personal God. And this is close to the reverse of what we see among the public. In the public, only 7% are atheists, approximately. But among scientists, we have the reverse. And this is an example of what Lewis saw coming as a result of belief in Darwinism. So he was a prophet. He was very clear and correct in this prediction. And of course, he wasn't a prophet due to inspiration but he was a prophet simply because he was perceptive in what was going on and was able to see where Darwinism was leading. Okay, what is Darwinism? What's the problem? Well, Darwinism explains design without the need for a designer. So if you accept Darwinism, there's no reason any longer to believe in God. Christians believe God was the designer, the, designer, the creator, but evolutionists, of course, have no need for that belief because, well, Darwinism was the designer. And when you survey people and ask them why they believe in God, almost invariably they say they believe in God because of the world around them, the birds, the trees, the sky, the beauty of our world, the animals, our pets, our dogs, our cats, people. And a creation requires, of course, an intelligent creator. And evolution has tried to come up for an explanation for the creation without a intelligent creator. And there you can see he is working hard on his one of his books. And some of the things he said, which will affect all people who read it and think about it, was, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, 
but because by it I see everything else. And that really, if you think about it, is very, very profound. And he saw, among other things, that evolution was not true because, well, because the Son, Jesus, has helped us realize that is the case. Experience, he said, is the most brutal of all teachers. But you learn, he said, by God you learn. And indeed, experience is a brutal teacher, but you really learn. It's a very effective way of learning. In fact, many of the things that we learn in our life are a result of a negative experience. And we learn by our own example. And sometimes we learn too late. And Hitler, of course, was not too fond of C.S. Lewis. In fact, he said he hated uh, C.S. Lewis because they had different philosophies, entirely different. And here is a set of five volumes of books which basically examine the life, works, and legacy of C.S. Lewis. As we said, he had an astounding number of works. He was very, very prolific. And one of his most well-known is Mere Christianity. And Mere Christianity is a summary of a lot of his lectures that he gave during World War II. And from a Christian website, this is what they said, the person said, for Christians who question the idea that evolutionary science and God as creator are in conflict, this person said, these beliefs can easily and faithfully be held together. What's his evidence for that? C.S. Lewis and others are examples of respected evangelical scholars who have openly affirmed evolution. What? And hold to a high value of biblical authority. Okay, the second part. But when we look into his writing, and by the way, I have another book, which is three times the length of the book that you have, which goes into much more detail, showing indeed how he eloquently, well, carefully, carefully, carefully documented his conclusion relative to evolution. And C.S. Lowe wrote to a friend, what inclines me now to think that you may be right in regarding evolution as the central and radical lie in the whole web of falsehood, falsehood that now governs our lives is not so much your arguments against it as the fanatical and twisted attitudes of its defenders. I mean, this is just profound what he has to say. When you are involved in critiquing evolution, you can see that its defenders are all too often fanatical and twisted. And I just rearranging my library because I'm running out of room and I had to move things out to the building behind the house. And I have a shelf of, oh, probably 25 feet, nothing but books written against our worldview against the creation worldview. And indeed, one thing that characterizes many of these is that the arguments are fanatical and twisted. And if indeed we're wrong, why spend time, energy, writing all these books showing indeed how we're wrong? And I find in reading many of these, by the way, I read them faithfully because this is where I get ideas to write books on my own. I read books that are written against the creation worldview. And in reading them, I find that so many of the authors are fanatical. And I wonder why. If evolution is true and our worldview is wrong, well, there is no God, there's no heaven, there's no hell, then why not live people their lives? Let them live their lives. But they don't. And then this is a quote from C.S. Lewis, and there are many, many quotes, and you don't want to be here till three o'clock in the morning, so I'll go through a few brief quotes. In the sciences, Lewis said, evolution is a theory about changes. In the myth, it is a fact about improvements. So he wasn't denying that life changes. We've read, read from wolves, from a couple dogs, 500 and some different breeds of dogs, and it seems they're keep breeding more in tech, we have now so many breeds with other breeds that we interbreed. And we have cockapoos and all kinds of neat new breeds. Well, Lewis wasn't talking about that. He wasn't talking about these changes. 
which produce variety in the natural world. He was talking about improvements, starting out with mice or bacteria, and we end up with people or horses. And therefore, that was what he was concerned about. So he was careful in defining his terms. So yeah, he would say, I believe in evolution, of course. Look around us. Look at what we've done with breeding flowers, plants, crops, corn, dogs, etc. No problem. The problem he had was the Darwinian, the myth about improvements, that we can start out with a mouse and end up with a horse. And he said also there's something fascinating about science. One gets such wholesale return of conjecture out of such trivial investment of facts. Oh, I thought that was said by C.S. Lewis. It wasn't. It was said by Mark Twain. And I find Mark Twain had a lot of attraction to his writings because in many ways he was a, a good writer, which so many of his words went beyond what he actually said. There's so much in his words beyond what the few words say. And uh, Lewis, 1925, he said in a letter to his father, it will be a comfort to me all my life to know that the scientists and the materialists have not the last word. What? That Darwin and Spencer, oh, Darwin and Spencer. And Spencer, of course, came up with the survival of the fittest interpretation of evolution, which Darwin, by the way, himself adopted. So Darwin and Spencer, undermining ancestral beliefs, stand themselves on a foundation of sand, of gigantic assumptions and irreconcilable contradictions an inch below the surface. This was said in 1925. By the way, he rejected evolution before he accepted God and Christianity. So one of the first, and he said, one of the first reasons I became an atheist, which he was, was because I accepted evolution. And so as I did more reading, remember his area was philosophy, as I did more reading and study, I realized that evolution is just not true. It's a foundation of sand. Then when he rejected evolution, then and only then did he move into accepting the creation, the creation worldview. And again, there's so many quotes that are just wrong. And I don't, I'm amazed. Don't these people read? And Francis Collin, who I admire, by the way, he's done quite well. As an atheist evolving to agnosticism and seeking answers to whether or not belief in God is potentially rational. This is what Collin said. My life was turned upside down 35 years ago by reading C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. So Francis Collins was converted from atheism to theism by reading C.S. Lewis. Ironically, though, Francis Collins himself believed that C.S. Lewis was a theistic evolutionist. And Lewis once wrote, I believe that no man or group of men is good enough to be trusted with uncontrolled power over others. And the higher the pretensions of such power, the more dangerous. A metaphysics held by the rulers with the force of a religion is a bad sign. He was talking about science, which has become, in many ways, metaphysics. Because science, evolution specifically, tells us where we came from. We evolved from apes. Where we're going? Well, we're not going anywhere. And what happens when life is over? Well, nothing. We're born, we live, and we die, and that's it. That's the metaphysical worldview that C.S. Lewis was talking about. It forbids them, like the Inquisitor, and later the Nazis and Communists, those are, by the way, Lewis's words, to admit any grain of truth in their opponents. It abnegates the rules of ordinary morality. It gives a seemingly, seemingly sorry, high super-personal sanction to all the very human passions by which like other men, the rulers will frequently be educated. And again, he's talking about Darwinism. His concern was that science was becoming totalitarian. And indeed, it was at that time. And we can see that today, especially since Darwinists want to determine what is taught in the schools and want to make sure that evolution is taught effectively and no other theory is allowed to enter into the classroom to contradict evolutionary theory. And a poem he wrote, 
He offered a nightmarish vision of a totalitarian state that served scientific food and chose for eugenic reasons who should mate. And of course, one offspring of Darwinism was eugenics. Totalitarianism is a political system where the state recognizes few limits to its authority and strives to regulate every aspect of public and private life. Well, that's familiar. Totalitarian regime, regimes stay in power through an all-encompassing propaganda campaign disseminated through established controlled media. And this describes not only total, totalitarian regimes, it also describes evolution and the power it has by the courts on our society. And that's a good closure, a summary of indeed uh, my concerns about C.S. Lewis. Now, again, I could give many more quotes, many excellent quotes, but uh, I think I've given enough material to stimulate your interest. By the way, of all the books I've written, ironically, and I've written books on Hitler and Nazism and so on, my book on C.S. Lewis is ironically the most controversial book I've ever written, but yet it is the most well-defended book of everywhere, of everyone I've written. Indeed, there's just, there's no question from Lewis's own writing. And now my latest book, which I hopefully will be out in a year or two, the publisher is working on it now, but I have almost 360 pages, many quotes from Lewis showing indeed that he was not only a critic of Darwinism, but he was the most effective critics of Darwinism that lived in the last century. And so for people to criticize my conclusions, hey, read my books, read C.S. <laughs> Lewis. And I, I just find it amusing that the books I've written, which are somewhat controversial, and yet this one, which is the least controversial book I've written, is ironically seen as controversial. I'll give you an example. I was supposed to, I asked to speak in, uh, in Indianapolis to the C.S. Lewis Society there. And when they found out my conclusion by reading the title of my book, they disinvited me and said, we don't want you to present at our C.S. Lewis Society. And I wow. said, that'd be an ideal place because I get some good critical feedback. I need that. Right. And they said, nope, we don't want you. You can come and listen and sit down and listen to the other speakers, but we don't want you to defend the idea that he was against evolution because he was an evolutionist. They firmly told me, so what, what can I do? Yeah, that's amazing, uh, Dr. Bergman. This is some really profound information. And uh, you had a slide up. Uh, actually, firstly, I'll say you're right. You know, we could have did a three, four hour presentation. So I just want to encourage people, uh, you know, this is almost just a snapshot in terms of the overall evidence for C.S. Lewis being an anti-Darwinist. So I do want to encourage people to <clears throat> pick up this must read book. But one of the quotes you, you had up on one of your slides, uh, Dr. Bergman, shows C.S. Lewis admitting to a friend in writing that he believed evolution may be a radical lie. You know, one of the biggest lies, uh, essentially, that, that we are fighting against. And my question that comes to mind, what kind of rebuttal um, or even critical feedback have you received, if any at all, to, uh, you know, your work in, in this book, uh, Jerry? Well, nothing really critical, nothing really that's effective. They basically say, well, he was a theistic evolutionist. I said, well, no, he wasn't. And, and then they, they, and they can find a course where he said, I accept evolution. And he, he mentioned and explained why. Well, sure, I accept evolution too. I, I have a dog, which is not like a wolf anymore. And so he's very much like a dog. And he evolved from the original wolf kind. And so that's not the problem. And when people bring this up, they say, you need to read what he had to say. I mean, he very clearly said, I'm not talking about breeding dogs or cats and so on. There's certainly an enormous amount of evolution. That's not the issue. The issue is, can we go up the complexity chain as a result of evolutionary mechanism? He made that very clear. And I, I think a lot of people, when they read it, they just, they assume he's an evolutionist and they read parts where he talked about this accordingly. And I don't think many people really concentrate on his thoughts relative to evolution. I didn't for a while until once I realized he was not a Darwinist, which is the word I prefer. He called it developmentalist. 
he was trying to avoid the term evolution and call them evolutionists, what we call evolutionists, developmentalists. And so in uh, once I was aware of this, I read C.S. Lewis in a new light. And I just found case after case after case. And my book on C.S. Lewis, which you showed the audience, I had a lot of people who wrote this and said, hey, you for, who read it, sorry, and wrote me and said, hey, you forgot this quote he said. Here you go. Oh, you forgot this quote. Oh, you forgot this paragraph. Oh, you forgot this. And I ended up going from 100 and some pages to 350 pages wow. because so many of my readers realized what I was saying was true and found other statements that he made, which are eloquent and basically support what I'm trying to say. So indeed, that's one reason, of course, why I decided to rewrite it. But but the book that I have that, that you showed to the audience does a good job. I think maybe some people said, yeah, 350 copies is kind of an overkill. And you can really get, that's why this book will stay in print, because you really get a good idea of what he believed on the book that's currently out. And Absolutely. therefore, you don't have to run out and buy the new one, but hopefully in a year when it's out. Well, um, again, you know, this is some fascinating information, because I have the great majority of C.S. Lewis books. When I first came to the world of Christianity and Christian apologetics, uh, Jerry, you know, his books were, were some of the first that I ever read and, and really got into. And uh, just looking at the uh, feedback in the audience, you know, that is uh, the same case for, for many other people. And and so to find out one thing I want to say based on what you're saying is it's true. We, we can't just, you know, take people like, for example, C.S. Lewis out of context because the greater debate of evolution and, and Dr. Bergman, I'm sure you're familiar with this, you know, evolution, if by evolution, you mean just change over time or change in allele frequencies and populations over generations, you know, there's nothing to, to debate there. We all agree on that, but right. by evolution, you know, they typically mean that, you know, dogs, wolves and, and plants, you know, strawberries and whales are all related through common ancestry. And so right. that is what C.S. Lewis is is questioning here. He is not questioning change over time. You know, that's right. something we all agree on. Right. Um, so one question here that comes in from the audience, more of a comment. Are you familiar with with any of the conversations? It's been a while since I studied up on this conversations between C.S. Lewis and um, J.R. Tolkien. Oh, yeah. The writer mm -hmm. of, of Lord of the I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. So from my understanding, um, much of the reasons for C.S. Lewis and his conversion had to do with his conversations with with Tolkien. I understand they were good friends. Can you kind of speak on that a little bit? Yeah, that's true. They were good friends. They both were professors at uh, I think at Oxford. He later on went to Cambridge or I think I can't may he was at Cambridge as well. But anyways, they were good friends. And Lewis had a lot of opposition, a lot of, well, in fact, he basically had to leave Oxford because the antagonism was so great. He realized he'd spend the rest of his career at Oxford never making advancements because they were not going to advance him. And the reason they were not, of course, is because his ideas about evolution. And therefore, he was aware, very aware, he had some excellent quotes relative to the opposition against people like him who questioned the whole neo-Darwinism scenario. And uh, therefore, it was great that he had someone that was in his his world. And Tolkien was, of course, that person, one person. Now, there are other people outside, but at Cambridge and at Oxford, my understanding is hard, hardly anybody was in his, his corner. And I think they just couldn't understand why he was selling so many books and they just didn't appreciate him. And although Cambridge did more so. So Cambridge uh, realized that he was may have written books that they didn't like, but on the other hand, hey, he's getting people to read books and he's attracting students and he's attracting money and so on. People went to Cambridge because C.S. Lewis was there. And so he attracted students, attracted good students. And so therefore uh, uh, they realized that it was important. And Lewis, to have one person that really is in the same room that you are in this field is really important. And I think that really helped Lewis deal with the opposition he got. Well, that's awesome. I appreciate that, Jerry. Um, okay, I got some specific questions on, uh, you know, C.S. Lewis in your book. I'm going to get through these first. And then I've got a few questions that are uh, somewhat unrelated to the C.S. Lewis topic and more so related to several of your new, uh, newly published articles. So let's 
do the C.S. Lewis ones first. This one comes in from Andrew Kaufman, five dollar uh, donation here. Appreciate the support, Andrew. And he asks, "What would you say is is the best quote from Lewis I can share with people? Or do you have Dr. Bergman, you know, a preferred or, or a favorite uh, quote from C.S. Lewis?" Oh boy, there's so many. I like his poem, uh, which was published after he died on uh, evolution. And I forget what he called it, the myth, but myth of evolution, I believe it was. But anyways, he did in that poem, he said a lot. What I showed you earlier was taken from that poem. And that I think is one of the most effective uh, appendix in my new book. I have his whole his whole summary of the problems of evolution. So I wrote, you know, I was trying to find out what's the favorite, your most favorite quote in the Bible. Well, let's see. <laughs> right, there's just so many. <laughs> Which do you want me to start one. with? I right. start with Genesis, we'll work forward. <laughs> <laughs> That's a favorite quote from each book. That'd be easier. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to the Bible, the whole book. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious in your interactions with more, uh, you know, of the militant theistic evolutionists, let's say some from BioLogos or affiliated with them. Do you find that a lot of them are up to date on this information regarding C.S. Lewis? Or um, are, are they more shocked when they hear about it and therefore, you know, deny it? Their response is just isn't true. Couldn't be true. He was an evolutionist. It couldn't be wow. true. Where do you get this idea from? Well, you could. I document this in my book. I'm not going to read your book. I don't have time to read your book. Why do you? Where do you come up with these ideas? So no, they're not too. Uh, <laughs> what I need is someone who says Bergman, you're wrong. Fine, read my book and let's get together and you can point out where I'm wrong. Exactly. I never had anybody take me up on that. So, That's great. So, hey, your audience, I'm wrong. <laughs> read my book. Point, point, point out where I'm wrong. Please do, because then maybe I, I shouldn't release this second book. So point out where I'm wrong. So buy the book, read it, and let me know where I'm wrong. And then I'll, I'll thank you. The next book I write, I'll, I'll dedicate it to you. Well, you're just looking for some honest, sophisticated, critical feedback, you know, and I do a lot of debates and host a lot of debates here. And what that is, is it's an assertion. And typically I like to say, thank you for the assertion. Now, where's the argument? <laughs> where's the data, yeah. right? The actual refutation. So, um, okay, here's an interesting question. This one comes in from the synagogue. Thank you so much for the question, CJ. And he asks, um, what are C.S. Lewis's view on the age of the earth? Okay, he never talked about that among many other things because he was not a geochronologist. He was not a biologist. And so he really, and he said this, he says, you know, most I can do is to stick in areas I know something about. He tried to debate with a student the biology, and he said, that I, I learned you really got to talk about things you know a lot about, and he can't deal with the age of the earth. But in some of his, uh, his stories, he, he, his characters, the earth was young. He did talk about a young earth in some of his stories. So my guess is, and this is only a guess, that he was a young earth supporter but he never talked about that and didn't come out uh, with that view publicly. But in his novels, it comes out in a couple of places. And so, and then that's all we can judge by. And I think he was wise in not debating vestigial organs or genetics or all these other things, because it would have just embarrassed him. He knew that. He knew he better stick with what he knew and knew about and not get into areas that he really couldn't defend. Right. That's a, uh, a good point. And also very interesting. You know, there's some more information that I was not um, aware of and, and very smart to, to stick with your field, it's especially, I guess, during that time. Um, a question that comes to mind would be, you know, who were the proponents during um, the time and, and ministry of, of C.S. Lewis of, of Young Earth creation? You know, who would have been those uh, d defending and upholding that truth? There, there wasn't many, that's, as you probably perceive. The first creation research organization was started in 1963. And okay. so Lewis obviously had no contact with this group. And there were a few young earth creationists, but pretty much in the Christian world, they accepted the old earth ideas. And it took Henry Morris and Whitcomb to, to realize that there's some problems. And now that we've done a lot of research, we realize the problems in the old earth view and the support for the young earth view. But back in the 60s, the 50s, and 40s, when, of course, Lewis was writing, my guess is he never even came across this. 
Now there was the uh, the Evolution Society in Great Britain. I forget the name of it. They changed the name later. But uh, the evolution, anyways, there was a, a organization that was critical of evolution, but they never talked about, as far as I know, the age question. They simply focused on the problems of the evolution worldview and very effectively. And uh, so therefore, if he read widely on this topic, I doubt if he would have come up with many references that would have uh, been useful in this area. Very good. I appreciate that, Dr. Bergman. I guess, what are your thoughts then? Because I'm confronted with a lot of critics. What are your thoughts of, of these claims that, that are not made by all old earth creationists and theistic evolutionists, but many make the claim that, well, you know, because of uh, Henry Morris and, um, you know, other leading young earth creationists who, who, who really kickstarted this, uh, you know, field in terms of young earth creation of apologetics, they'll say that young earth creation, as we know today, is a modern invention. You know, it, it wasn't believed or defended all throughout history. And so they use that as a way to, to, to kind of discredit young earth creation, to say it's, it's a new invention and therefore we shouldn't trust it. Do you have any thoughts on that, Jerry? Well, actually throughout history, almost throughout history until, oh, I would say the early 1800s, most Christians and most scientists were young earth creations. So that was a dominant view for much of history. And uh, some weren't, some were look, looked at long ages, but by and large, they accepted the uh, young earth view for most of, and you can you know read this in the, the books that they wrote. Even some of the more famous scientists accepted that view. It was only the 1800s where this view was questioned and you had more and more long earth, old earth creations. And then of course, in the, with the Seventh-day Adventists around the turn of the last century, you had more young earth creationists and finally Henry Morris, of course, and John Whitcomb and others began to uh, accept the young earth view and begin to write and do research on this worldview. So it actually, the long earth view was popular for maybe a century or two and that's all. Well, that's very interesting. So, you know, when they make these arguments then it, it's kind of an uneducated argument. Um, to say that it's a modern invention. So I, I appreciate that response. Um, this question comes in from Taylor K. Thank you so much for the question, Taylor. And uh, she's got a question for you, Jerry. She asked, in the last chapter of Mere Christianity, and she's also pointed out in the chat that she just, um, from my understanding, finished reading this book recently. So great timing, <laughs> Taylor. And she says, uh, Lewis sounds a bit like an evolutionist in the last chapter of Mere Christianity. Did he change his opinion later in life? Or what are your thoughts on this, Jerry? Well, he, many times where you're talking about uh, support evolution, what he was trying to say is that the message of Christ was still valid, even if we evolved from apes, even if some of what they say is true. He's not saying, I agree that this is true. He's saying even if the evolutionary worldview is true, it's still the Christ Christian message is still valid. It doesn't negate it. And so those are the, I'm pretty aware of what you're talking about, but those were the areas where he was basically saying this, he did this. He said, well, what if this is true? What about Christianity? And he again was not saying, I think this is true, but he was saying, what if this is true? He did a lot of hypotheticals, a good writer, a good author, he basically said, well, what about this worldview? Well, it's with this worldview, you could still accept this other idea of relative to Christianity in this case. So now if you read carefully what he had to say, he wasn't trying to push the evolutionary worldview. And I think that's why your arguments in your book is so powerful, Dr. Bergman, because you've looked at this so thoroughly and you've documented this so comprehensively where most critics they haven't looked into it. And, and so the, the, it's going to be problematic when, when they try and refute it. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to now some questions that are somewhat unrelated to the C.S. Lewis topic. But uh, that being said, you know, we do have a fantastic audience right now. So please feel free to tag me with, with any other questions pertaining to uh, the C.S. Lewis topic. Taylor K. does say uh, thank you so much for, for the response there, Jerry. So... Um, you recently published a technical article on creation.com titled uh, Research Has Overturned Endosymbiosis, The Unbridgeable Gap Between Prokaryotes and Eukaryotes Remains. Um, 
My question is, can you touch on the significance of this issue, especially because here in, in the debate community and a lot of the interactions that, that I have with evolutionists, including leading evolutionists, they still look to this as, as a viable or plausible explanation, uh, Dr. Bergman. Yeah, what I looked at basically is, can you go from a prokaryotic cell, which has essentially no organelles, to a eukaryotic cell, which has, of course, the mitochondria and the Golgi complex and the nucleus and nucleolus and a bunch of others. How do you go from one to the other? And they're basically saying that the eukaryotic cell became a eukaryotic cell because it swallowed a bacteria. And the bacteria then became a nucleus and possibly came in different views. Of course, Lynn Margulis is most well known for this idea, but there are other views on that same subject. But basically they're saying that the eukaryotic cell as a result of eating, swallowing other bacteria, which eventually adopted to become uh, organelles in the cell, which became a eukaryote. Yeah, there's a lot of people who accept that because what other choice do they have? I mean, that's the best explanation to have for how we get eukaryotic cells. But even among the evolutionary community, and I have a number of well-known Darwinists, evolutionists, who realize that that's really problematic. In fact, Lynn Margulis' idea of endosymbiosis was problematic from day one and uh, had critics from day one. It's just the critics got tired of criticizing her and I guess moved on to other things. So the criticisms they brought out when she first came up with her theory are still valid. And I found it easy. In fact, the problem I had in writing that paper was trying to get it down to, you know, 30 pages. And that was difficult because there indeed there's a, a lot of criticism, a major, major problem. Number one, we just have no evidence for this. It's a philosophical argument. It's a, a uh, think argument. We sit down, we think about what could happen. We have no concrete evidence. And even as, as a think argument, it's problematic because we know that that cannot logically occur in most cases. And we, it's easy to sit down and come up as all I did, sit down and come up with a lot of really major problems with this whole idea of endosymbiosis. And lack of evidence, major problem. And the fact is, it's just not going to work. And, uh, and of course, how do the bacteria do what it's supposed to do until the bacteria change into a mitochondria or change into a nucleus or whatever they hypothesize it uh, came to? And therefore, it's uh, really problematic. In fact, so much so that a lot of scientists have just given up on that idea. It's just not. A, it's better to say we don't know how the eukaryotic cells developed as opposed to proposing the endosymbiosis. But on the other hand, it's the only game in town, the endosymbiosis. So what do you do? I mean, if you're an evolutionist and you believe it must have evolved, well, that's the best theory there is. may not be a good theory, but on the other hand, it's the best theory they have that explains it. I mean, can you come up with a better theory? <laughs> Evolutionists have been able to. And uh, creationists, of course, the other theory is that God created uh, right. organisms that were eukaryotic. And therefore, that's our explanation. But the evolutionists throw that out. What do you have left? And so it's a matter of default. Amen. Great response, uh, Dr. Bergman. You're absolutely right. It's a philosophical argument. It's a story and it's not uh, scientific. You've done a, a fantastic job showing the major problems with this, uh, with this story. And you said, you know, the major problem that you faced was uh, making sure that, you know, it, it, it didn't go too long. And I can see just reading that paper, which I just posted in the uh, in the chat for people to check out. It, it's very comprehensive and you really d do go through a lot. So you're saying a lot of people, a lot of evolutionary scientists have discarded this story. And now they're just saying, Dr. Bergman, that they don't really know. They're, they're hoping for an answer in the future, but currently they don't know. Yeah, they're in clean out my library. I came across a genetics book. And I remember why I bought that. I bought the whole book for this one quote. And he has a section in the book, which basically he says, endosymbiosis is just not viable. And we ought to stop embarrassing ourselves and using this as an explanation for eukaryotic cells. And this is an evolutionist. He's done an excellent job in discussing the rest of the book. And he just realizes that one of many he realizes that's just not viable. It's the only game in town for him. That's what you said, Dr. Bergman. Yeah, so. that's much. 
<laughs> if you're an evolutionist, you could see where they would accept that. I mean, right, right. Well, uh, that, they've really got no other choice. It it really baffles my mind when it comes to the theistic evolutionists, right? That at least claim to to believe the Bible, but yet they want to adopt, you know, the these fancy stories that are just filled with major unsolvable problems, I believe, based on, on what you've put forth, uh, Jerry. Yeah. It's like when I worked for the court, I was in corrections for a while. When a spouse is killed, always the first suspect is the other spouse. A woman's killed, the husband is a person of interest, always, period. And then basically he's, you know, unless he can clearly prove that he didn't do it, uh, basically you have to find a better a better suspect. And so, you know, they buy a process of elimination, you and you they you can eliminate the husband usually pretty quickly. But on the other hand, sometimes you can't, and it turns out in the long run that he was the he did murder his wife. You just can't really uh, have enough proof to prove that he did it to prove it in court. Great points, Dr. Bergman. I appreciate it. Here's a question that comes in from Doki Doki Bible Club. Thank you so much for your question, Doki. So Doki asks, Jerry, did you grow up believing in evolution? Well, when I was really young, I was became aware of the creation worldview. And then when I went to college, I remember this so vividly to this day. I read my paleoanthropology book, and I saw in the cover, actually in the front cover of the book, you can see the progression from apes to modern humans. And in the book, it showed pictures of the skulls they found of an ape. And then the slow changes occurred until we got modern humans. And I, I remember I looked at that and I thought, how can you deny that? This is physical evidence. It must be true. And therefore, I accepted the evolutionary worldview for uh, quite a while. And so I was a committed evolutionist for, I would say, committed, 98% committed. And then as I read more and more, I began to realize that there's some holes in that. And that's why I wrote this book, Apes as Ancestors, because I spent a huge amount of time in this 900-page book to basically show, indeed, that these claimed ancestors were either apes, period, or humans, period. There's nothing clearly in between. And so I was convinced, and many people were convinced, and I collect old textbooks, and in these textbooks I find one of the strongest proofs of human evolution for about 50, 60 years was they'd have an ape, and then they would have a less ape-like ape, and then they would have, say, a australopithecine, and then they would have a, uh, uh, a person from Australia, a native Australian, and then the next they would have is a, a black, a Negro, and then a white. And they would state this is the progression from apes to modern humans. And one of the links of that was, of course, the Negroes or other races, the Aborigines, for example. And uh, this is, was used as proof convincing many, many people for, for almost a century. And now we realize that this is not true, that uh, modern men and all Races are equal biologically, and uh, the Neanderthals, which, by the way, were part of that progression, Neanderthals now we recognize are fully human. If a guy was next door who was Neanderthal, you'd have no problem spending time with him. He'd look just like you, and he's dressed up with a suit and tie. And so now they've, most of the links that I saw in the books when I was teaching, and most of the links which you saw through for 50 years, most of them, all of them actually, sorry, have been thrown out. And so now we have to find new ones and the new ones are problematic as well. So Java man's thrown out, Piltdown man's thrown out, Peking man's been thrown out. And so all of these are thrown out now. And now they have others to replace them, which uh, the book that I did, and me and my co-authors, Peter Line for, for one, were able to show that all these so-called missing links are, they're not links. They're either apes or humans. Although some humans that look like apes, I have to admit, but that's another story. <laughs>
Well, that's a very uh, detailed answer. I appreciate that. I do want to remind the audience that in the description box, especially for anybody new here, uh, subscription wise, we've done two previous programs with Jerry, uh, very thorough programs on human evolution and one on Neanderthals. Um, and Dr. Bergman, I like how you pointed out that all these icons of evolution, right, for ape to man evolution, they've been discarded, they've been discredited. And nowadays, I find the evolution is putting forth two candidates, Homo habilis and Australopithecus sediba. And yet, even in the uh, paleo literature, the um, paleo anthropologists themselves are saying, no, habilis is a wastebasket taxon, right? And then Sedaba, I, I know specifically of one paper by Ella Bin and Yoel Rack, where they say, no, this is an artificial species, the accidental mixture of human bones and ape bones. So now even their, their best so-called two examples of transitional forms that they like to use today in 2022 have also been discredited. And this was the source of information for my book. What we did is looked at their critics. And um, I don't know of one single paleoanthropologist who doesn't have his critics. And so you look at his critics and they often do a very good job basically showing that indeed he's wrong. But of course, my theory, it's my theory. And if you criticize my theory, yeah, you've got some points, but I still accept my theory. It's better than your theory. And so it's a one upsman, my theory and your theory. And so we find this is true in paleoanthropology. Well, all we have is a bunch of bone fragments. Typically we have like three or 4% of the entire skeleton. And a skeleton is only, what, 10% of the entire body? So we're basing uh, what they look like on maybe 3 or 4% of the entire body. So that's why there's so much controversy. Well, it's, it's exactly why all major finds, as you're pointing out, in the world of paleoanthropology are contested. They refute each other. And there's so much co competition to find, you know, the best so-called missing link. Um, and when it comes to, as you pointed out, Jerry, so perfectly, what we're looking at is is a, a fossil record that that's so highly fragmented, and therefore you can build the most fancy stories. I'd be curious, Jerry, since you've done so much work on this, um, when it comes to the Australopithecine, specifically Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, I've even seen, uh, unfortunately, some creationists jump on board with this. Uh, and I'm curious as to your thoughts. Do you believe there's any validity to the claim or idea that Australopithecus afarensis or other various forms of the Australopithecines walked upright? That's problematic. And uh, I have a whole PowerPoint on that, which I've given several times. And uh, it's hard to believe that they could actually call this a viable transitional form. It just, I hate to say pathetic, but I guess a compliment would be to say it's pathetic that Australopithecines, especially the Afarensis Lucy, is really major, major problematic. And uh, it's, I guess it's the best they have. So again, you know, you take the best example you have. But what bothers me is in museums, Lucy is shown with hands and feet and walking upright and looking like pretty much a modern human, modern ape mixture human. And, uh, so much artistic license is used in order to produce these mannequins, which are just they're pathetic. And Lucy, they claim, is 40% complete. But many of the bones they say are complete are not complete. And so weight-wise, you have about 20% of Lucy. And that's one of the most complete uh, examples we have. And so 20%, you're saying that you can describe whether he walked upright, et cetera, or she, they claim she, although that's not known. But anyways, uh, it's... You really only have 20% to judge on. And the question is whether or not this is all part of one person. What bothers me is that they're walking around, they see a bone sticking up and they start to dig around it and they say, ha ha, it's a human bone. And then they find most of the bones not too far from they found this one bone. And I just really have a hard time recognizing that this bone is 20 million or 10 million or whatever years old when it's could be 20 years old. And of course, you can't date the bones. There's typically no carbon-14 that I'm aware of in there, or it's hard to debate to date the bones. Or when you do, it doesn't, don't, they're not shown as old as they claim they are. And so they try to date the bones according to the sediment they're found in, the volcanic ash, for example. And that's problematic. And I think a lot of them are just a couple hundred years old. 
They're not even a million or even a thousand years old. They're fairly new. And most of them are found fairly close to the surface. And they're not, uh, you don't have to dig a hole 40 feet down to find them. It's a great response. And what they'll fail to tell you is there's significant overlap. Where they even admit in their technical literature, you have significant coexistence and intermi intermingling between, you know, the Homo genus. They'll typically point to Homo erectus and the Australopithecines. So, uh, you know, this co-mixture, the accidental mixture of human bones in with these, uh, you know, ape bones, non-human ape bones, the evolutionists would say, is actually quite common. Um, so you've done so much good work on, on that, Jerry. So I want to recommend your book apes as ancestors and um also your presentations that that you've done with us so I, I guess my next question here is um on your website your specific website that i also have linked in the description box <clears throat> you have a recent article titled gene duplication is not a credible source of evolutionary progress and this is an important issue since proponents of evolution like to point to gene duplication as a way to drive large scale evolution. Is this really the case, uh, Jerry? And, and could you speak a little on this? Well, what they claim is you have a gene, it duplicates, and now you've got a gene, a copy of the gene. And the copy then can be mutated and evolve into doing something else where the gene that does the work is still okay. The problem is when you have gene duplication, why do we assume the copy is going to sustain mutations and the original is not? Now, I would guess there's equal likelihood that both the copy and the original gene are going to sustain mutations. And therefore, it doesn't really solve the problem. And of course, gene copying is a problem. And we have diseases like uh, muscular dystrophy is a good example. And there are others as well that uh, basically are a result of gene duplication, which can cause a problem. You can basically upregulate some protein too much when you have gene duplication. So gene duplication is not often benign. It's a problem. And for uh, certain diseases, it's, it's a serious problem. Like uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, for example, is one, ex one example. And there are others uh, I'm trying to think of uh, the one that... Uh, causes not amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, but the one that causes, you can't tell that it's the person is a, it's a problem until their 30s, 40s, and 50s, and it's always 100% lethal. I'm trying to think of the name of the, the disease, the disorder, but that's a good example of excessive gene mutation. Right. Uh, producing excessive copies as a result of mutations, and therefore... Uh, well, it's been a while since I taught this, but anyway. Is it so Huntington's disease? Huntington's, you, you got it. Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease. That's it. Yeah, no, great response. And, you know, it's it, it's a sad reality, but it's reality nonetheless that, you know, there's an, a, a mutation accumulation problem. And, and they're not drivers of evolution, as you're pointing out. They, they lead to uh, damage, disease, degeneration. So my question then, out of, out of curiosity, uh, Dr. Bergman, if you're duplicating a gene or, or a region of the genome, and, and that region that's accumulated deleterious mutations over time, aren't you then duplicating the damage with it? Aren't you, aren't you duplicating or, or taking with, with it the um, deleterious mutations that, that have accumulating over well, time? Yeah, you are, and that's another problem in that. Assuming the gene is perfect, has no mutations, and then if it's duplicated, fine. But chances are most genes have some mutations, or at least the majority of, me, of genes have some damage that has been caused throughout history. And therefore, when a copy is made, the copy has all the mutations the first gene originally had. Sometimes at the beginning, at the end of a gene, you can have mutation. It doesn't cause a problem. And we know, of course, about... 90% of the mutations are not highly deleterious, but they're mildly problematic, what they call near neutral, and they still can produce normal protein that doesn't cause a major problem. And so the gene that duplicates probably will have these minor mutations as well. And therefore, and that's good that the vast majority, of course, are near neutral because it's, we're still alive. And we can stay alive with a fair number of mutations. But of course, eventually the number of mutations increases. Mutational load is high enough 
so that we end up causing a genetic meltdown. So that's a concern, but yeah, that's, but again, they're trying to come up with an explanation that deals with their problems. So, you know, a wife is dead and husband didn't do it. Well, we got to keep looking and got to find right. somebody that did it. So an ex-boyfriend or somebody that uh, had a crush against somebody else or who had an argument against somebody else, who knows? Well, and, and these leading evolutionary population geneticists admit, I've got quote after quote after quote, where they're admitting that effectively neutral mutations are a problem. You know, they decrease fitness over time, they accumulate, and they're essentially invisible to natural selection. Natural selection can't see them. And so they build up, they spread through genetic drift, and they uh, result in, in genetic sickness. And on the gene duplication argument, they're trying to say that gene duplication is going to drive forward evolution, and yet it's only going to speed up the degeneration process. Yeah, that's a good, a good comparison. And that's true. Uh, most mutations are genetically neutral that's why they call them near neutral because they're really not 100 percent neutral they don't cause enough damage to cause a problem but they invariably add up and so therefore you have accumulation of near neutral mutations and you have genetic meltdown which of course causes big problems so that's what causes aging you have very few mutations when you're six months old when you're two years old when you're five years old but they add up so by the time you're 70 or 80 you have lots of mutations and that shows in your Hearing is less effective. Your eyesight is less effective. Less effective. Your overall health is less effective because all those near neutral mutations add up and become a problem. Well said. Well said, Jerry. I, I've sent in a question, and I'm not going to have enough time to read the, the page that was attached to the question. So it's an interesting question. I think we kind of touched on it earlier, but it looks like uh, Dr. Bergman. It's from uh, C.S. Lewis and his book, uh, Mere Christianity Again. And the page that I see, if, if I'm not mistaken, is 171, The New Man. So it's a chapter, The New Man. And it looks like, I guess the questioner is asking, you know, based on what C.S. Lewis is writing here, it, it looks like he is advocating at least for, for evolution. Um, and, and I think you did address this earlier, but if you could maybe re reiterate, or do you have any thoughts on that exactly? Yeah, if it's the quote I'm thinking of, he basically is saying, if this was true, then the Christian message would still be valid. But he's not himself saying that this is true. He's saying, given this possibility, then this other conclusion would still be valid. And so I don't know if you can find it and read it in the page. Yes. Yeah, I'm looking at it here. Maybe you can find it. And... I, I, I think you are right. Um in, uh, in the last chapter. Yeah, I'll have to read it later. Maybe I can get a bit of a summary, but um, I, I, th I think you're right there. And, and plus, you know, I, I would encourage anybody too is just joining us since we do these live, uh, your presentation and your book here, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis was pretty clear that uh, evolution itself in, in terms of forward evolution is, is a lie. Um, so I guess my, my next question here is we start to wind it down, uh, Dr. Bergman, I'm looking at the time here. And as always, I appreciate the, your generosity in terms of your time. You're always very thorough in, in your answers. And I, I just love your articles that, that come out very frequently. And one last one I wanted to ask you about is this one is specifically on your website, Dr. Bergman. And it's a newly published article. It's titled Mutations Are Not the Main Source of Genetic Variety for Evolution. And, uh, you know, what I read in, in, in the article itself, I believe has very significant implications for the origins debate and the question of ancestry. Could you talk a little bit a, about this for us? Yeah, maybe you could, because I've written several articles in that area. So maybe you could mention a little bit more about the article. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, I got it pulled up here and you, you talk about a, a specific study and the results in it, how um, mutations, even, even the ones that the evolutionary community want to say are absolutely neutral, turn out that, that they're not. You know, they're still nearly neutral, which means they are going to have some kind of effect on the genome. And you're looking at, uh, this specific paper is looking at synonymous variation, synonymous mutations versus um, non-synonymous mutations and how these redundant elements, you know, they're not just there to, um, 
act as a buffer essentially. Oh, they okay. also act you. in mutation flow. I got you and, now. Okay. <laughs> what you have is you have a mutation in the genome which changes a letter. So the same amino acid is still coded for. So it's coded in the original way, certain alanine, for example, and then the mutation chain occurs and then alanine is still made. And so the conclusion was for many years, it doesn't matter which code you use because you still get the same amino acid chain. Therefore, it doesn't matter. Well, they found out it does matter for a number of reasons. One is, is that a certain code is key to the system. And so when you have another code, it may not be as effective because the system's not designed to deal with that other code. In other words, each code has a connective point. For example, the tRNA, the transfer RNA, has a certain set of parts that have to be part of it in order for the amino acid conversion to occur. And so therefore, even though you have the same amino acid, you don't have the same system that makes the chain because the chain is designed to deal with certain codes. Certain codes are more common, so the system is, can deal with that more common code. Other codes, even though they code for the same amino acid, are less common, and therefore the conversion system that changes that code into the amino acid chain is less common. And so the matching is, is wrong. And so that's why even if you end up with a mutation that causes a different uh, code, but yet the same amino acid is produced, nonetheless, that still causes a problem. So they're not near, near new or they're not neutral as they thought they were. They were, they create a problem. And, and that's a great response because for, I think years, a lot of your major proponents of evolution, especially from BioLogos, they've used that against us. And now what we're finding, as you've pointed out, is multiple overlapping codes where we have the same amino acid, but not exactly the, the same system. So the evolutionists have assumed it's neutral, but at, at the same time, no, a mutation there can actually uh, affect the, uh, you know, the, the slowing or, or speeding, uh, essentially, of, of the information flow in, in the cell and um, can have detrimental effects. So I, I think that was a really good article as well, Dr. Bergman, that I'm currently putting in the uh, live chat as well for people. Um, because I, I've seen some evolutionists, I'm curious as to your thoughts, where they've looked at these redundant elements that they would call, you know, neutral variation. They build these hierarchical trees, these gene trees, and they try and say, well, because of these trees, we've got humans closer to chimpanzees than they are to, you know, gorillas and orangutans. But they're assuming that these trees are based on neutral variation. But I think what you're pointing out is this is actually functional variation. Right. Yeah. So I'm looking here at the chat and, you know, Dr. Bergman, again, you've, you've done a fantastic job. I've got several of your, uh, you know, newly written articles uh, posted for people. And um, this is just a really fascinating discussion. A lot of people saying what I said, that uh, this is some profound information on, on C.S. Lewis. Uh, Dr. Bergman. So I encourage people to look more into it. And again, pick up the book here, uh, C.S. Lewis, anti darwinist So it's, it's worth the read. It's worth the purchase. Jerry, I want to hand it to you for some final thoughts, final words. And again, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, I appreciate the support. It's uh, sometimes a lonely world out there. So I can understand that C.S. Lewis really valued the friendship he had at, uh, the few colleagues he had were in harmony with him. And so, you know, when I taught at the state university, just about everybody there was opposed to what I was doing. And so therefore it's nice to have people out there like you and others that are supportive. So there are a lot of us out there. It's just, we don't always support each other like we should. And I have to really mention that what I've done, the only way I could have done what I've done so far is with the support of so many others that every book I write has input of three, four, five, six, sometimes 10 different people. And so there's no way I could write those books totally on my own without the support of a lot of people. And so that's critical. I really need to spend more time thanking those who I work with who are able to uh, help me and uh, achieve what I have achieved. Amen. Amen. Well, we're the body of Christ, brother. And, you know, we're here to support each other and, and uphold the truth 
together. That's what we do here at Sanford Truth Ministries is, is we defend the truth of biblical creation. And, you know, it, it's it's such a blessing to have men of God like yourself that are just working tirelessly to defend the faith. So last thing I want to say, Doki Doki Bible Club uh, right here is uh, entering the relevant information for uh, Jerry Bergman's uh, website where you can find these articles that I highly recommend reading on his website. Also one article specifically on endosymbiosis, which is on CMI. And uh, here's where you can find his book, C.S. Lewis, Anti-Darwinist, a, uh, a careful examination of the development of his views on Darwinism. So amazon.com. Okay. Well, Jerry, thank you so much again. And I appreciate the final words and final thoughts. And hopefully we can have you on again soon in, in the future. I know you're a busy man and uh, God bless you and God bless the audience. Standing for Truth okay. is out.